Hi, my name is Jules Jaffe. I'm a research oceanographer here at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla, California. We're standing here on the hill of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. We're part of the University of California, San Diego, where about 1,400 people work. Basically, the Scripps Institution, founded about 100 years ago, a little more than 100 years ago, is devoted to understanding geosciences, and that includes studying the Earth, the oceans, the atmosphere. As part of our tools for studying those things, we use photonics, we use light, and as part of understanding all types of things about the global ecosystem, we have experts here in radiative transfer and how light goes through clouds and how the oceans are heating up and how plants use light to harvest energy and power more or less you know a huge part of the global ecosystem. We believe that there's so much to learn about the ocean and that one of the big frontiers is basically inventing things to study it. But one of the frontiers in my estimation in ocean instrumentation in order to study microbes is the development of instruments that would allow us to survey volumes of water in order to estimate the size spectrum of the organisms that are there. I came up with an idea to use backscattered light. And it turns out that um, if you look at the theory of how light is scattered uh, by matter, electromagnetic theory, which is very, very familiar to many people now, uh, it turns out that life is pretty simple in understanding that theory if you have what we call our weak scatterers. And so the first thing I did was to look at simulations and to decide whether marine microbes are in fact weak scatterers. And this has to do with their complex index of refraction and, and their contrast with their environment. If they're low contrast, you have a weak scatterer. So that's good. You can understand the theory easily. Maybe it's bad because you don't get a lot of scatter, but nevertheless we have sensitive uh, photo detectors. We have lasers and other types of illumination that can give us enough signal to noise so that we can in fact measure the scatter from weak scatterers in the ocean, which we now know consist of microbes, and we can actually interpret those scattering patterns. And so the idea is to look not only at the forward scattered light, but also to look at the backscattered light. And so the link that we've been making is this weak scattering and studying the backscattered light. And based on those impressions and preliminary data, we've actually recently been funded by the National Science Foundation to build a new kind of microscope or take existing micro microscope and modify it so that we can actually look at backscattered light and test some new ideas about sizing microbes to solve this riddle about what is the size distribution of organisms in the ocean? How does it differ as a function of latitude and longitude? How does it differ in areas where there is a lot of oxygen or not a lot of oxygen? How might it be changing as the planet warms up? And so all of these things now are potentially possible if we are able to figure out how to size these little teeny guys that are so important in the sea. The challenge in, in um, building this device was we wanted something that would allow us to measure the ambient light environment. And so when we talk about that from the science point of view, we talk about radiometry, and we'd really like to know the radiance environment in the ocean. So what does that mean? Uh, it's the amount of light that's coming from all different directions um, in, in quantitative terms. And so we're studying that light because of a new project that we started in the last year under Navy funding in order to understand squid and how they change their color based on their environment, their neighbors, their ability to encounter other squid. And that study has a number of dimensions. One dimension is to understand the environment of the animal and how the animal changes in response to that environment. And it turns out that the biophotonics of squid skin is something that's really, really interesting. We're finding, and they're finding, I should say, and I'm watching them find, how these animals actually change their color. And they do that by changing this, the distance between proteins that scatter light. And in your mind, I want you to just think about this thing slowly descending while all these cameras are taking pictures at even close to 100 hertz because the squid has a flicker fusion frequency that's on the order of 60 hertz. So we have to go pretty fast in order to record these. And so we're excited about this new device. We want to put it in kelp forests, coral reefs. Uh, part of our work is in outreach, getting kids excited about science, and so having omnidirectional capability. And so maybe we'll have a, a street view, just the way you can sign on and 
walk around on the street, you can have a, a coral street view where you can walk around in our coral forest or you can walk around in our kelp forest. And in this lab, we are developing what I hope to be a wonderful achievement in ocean instrumentation, little vehicles. These miniature vehicles were inspired by the behavior of little animals called larvae that are basically babies when an animal would, say, broadcast uh, and, and, and make babies. There are various strategies for animals to do that. I won't go into all the details. Uh, these little babies are really small, so they can be on the order of, say, 100 microns, which is about the width of a human hair. And so they can't swim very well. But yet, they have the capability of going out in the ocean for a couple of months and then coming back to settle. And so if you look at something like a lobster, maybe a lobster has a million babies. And we'd really like to know, how do those guys that are so small that they can hardly swim make it back to shore? And what fraction of them make it back to shore? Certainly they must take advantage of opportunistically changes in the environment, of seasons, of tides, of the moon. But the details of currents and how they change in space and time are actually not very well known. And so this guy, it's a lot bigger than a 100 micron organism, nevertheless has some capability to mimic the behavior of those animals. And these guys are really just passive tracers. The next step in doing this is this vehicle over here, which is called the AUE, Autonomous Underwater Explorer. These we've called the mini AUEs. And this actually now has enough battery power to have sensor packages on it. And so not only do we want to understand the currents in the ocean, but we want to have sensors that can maybe sense light level, can look at fluorescence and tell us about phytoplankton concentration. Maybe they'll have miniature cameras, the kind we have on, say, cell phones, which would allow us to put these in the water and have them go over areas, interesting areas like coral reefs and, and sort of opportunistically take mosaics. And so this combination of little guys, lots of them, that we can localize and bigger guys that have sensors, we hope, and, and the number of funding agencies have agreed fortunately, will be sort of a next generation of ocean instrumentation. And I think what's driving this is the miniaturization of electronics, the affordability, and then the last thing I want to say about this program is our outreach effort because we need to recruit more kids into science and engineering. And as part of that, we're thinking of building kits so that we can put these in high schools, we can put these in junior high schools. Kids can send these back to us and watch where they go on Google Earth. So they can actually participate with us in what I think is the most exciting part of what we do is the discovery process of learning things because we're measuring stuff that nobody's ever measured before.